1 Corinthians 13, 8, love never fails. Right out of the scripture. I just believe that our Lord delights when we sing to him. Let me say this very carefully. I think there are appropriate times to sing about him. But I think what really gets his motor running is when we sing to him and we make those declarations and we praise him for that love that never fails. Uh, I, like maybe some of you in the room, grew up in the church in a time when people were afraid uh, to be very personal with God. When God was this ogre in the sky that really all he was about was if you did anything wrong, he was going to get you. And uh, I mean, that's kind of how I was raised. And all our songs were historical in nature. They sang about God and who he was. But we never did much to really get up in his lap and tell him that we love him. And I just never, I wasn't raised that way, just to be honest with you. And you know, frankly, maybe a lot of you in this room have not had that experience in your spiritual pilgrimage. Well, I pray that God is going to use Riverside to help you get over it. And I, I pray that you are going to learn to have this unbelievable relationship. You know, things have changed so much uh, since I first started ministry in the 1800s. Um, and I'm, I'm starting to feel a little old in some of those areas. But, you know, it, it has so radically changed. Um, you, you know, I can, I can remember when, when, I, when I stood up to teach or preach and I talked about God, um, I mean, everybody, even those that had no personal relationship with him, they knew who I was talking about. I mean, there was no question. When, when you, you talked about God, you were talking about the God of the Bible. You were talking about the God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament, and uh, certainly you would get to Jesus. They, they knew what that was all about. And yet, um, wow, that has really changed. But you know, I, I don't think that's something that's just unique to our culture. In, in fact, I was thinking this week and in preparation for this message, um, you know, even in this room, and, and let, me, let me first of all say I'm, I'm going to describe uh, some groups of people here today. And I want you to know we are glad that you're here. I hope I've already expressed that in our welcome. But you know, even in this room, there are some folks that when you say God, the first thing that comes to their mind is, well, who are you talking about? I mean, because where we live, people say there are a lot of gods. And probably a large percentage of you in the room, you, you think, what? What's that all about? Really? No. I mean, we know who he's talking about. Well, no. No. And in fact, most of the people that God has called us to reach with his great message of love and forgiveness and, and relationship, most of those people have no clue of the God of which we speak. And, and let me give you an example of that. If you, we're not going to turn there just yet, but if you were to turn to, say, to Acts chapter 2 and, and you see Peter standing up after the Spirit of God fell and empowered them and and there the Holy Spirit is, is working through them. And Peter is preaching. Peter is preaching, teaching a primarily Jewish audience. And he teaches very historically in context. And they understood. They got it. Because that was the God. They, they knew that. But if you trace that through just a few chapters as the, the church begins to explode, obviously God calls the church to reach not just their us four and no more, as is often the case of so many churches. But God calls them to reach the nations. And so they began to teach and preach. And all of a sudden, they realized their audience changed. And can I tell you? So did their methodology. And if you'll find, you'll see, you'll see Paul standing up. Go, go just sometime, go to Acts chapter 17. There Paul on Mars Hill. And think about the difference where Peter, standing to a, in front of a crowd that knew exactly who he was talking about, talked about this... Jewish God, this historical God, and they all got it. And now you, you see Paul standing on Mars Hill recognizing that he was not in a monotheistic culture any longer. And so he begins to teach in a way that really says, let me tell you who this God is that I'm talking about. Now, friends, listen to me very carefully. We've got to make that switch. If we're going to be effective and if we're going to be used of the Holy Spirit to do what the New Testament church is primarily all about after it glorifies God, then we've got to learn to flip that switch and to quit assuming that people understand who this God is that we're talking about. 
Now, you're all just kind of staring at me. Is any of this making sense at all? Is that, is that connect? You, you following me at all? I didn't ask you if you liked it. Because <laughs> I got to tell you, I don't necessarily like it. I just want to get around people who like me and ride motorcycles and have a good time. You know, I mean, that's, that's what I'm all about. By the way, I, I see there, Gary. Good to see you guys. We've got some folks here from our Church in the Wind today. Glad you're here with us today. Welcome. Glad you're here. <clears throat> So, uh, and I, I'm very comfortable with you guys. This is what I'm used to. So, at First Southern in Dell City in Oklahoma, we got a, people wear their colors every Sunday. It's a huge crowd. So, we're, we're glad that you guys are here today. Are you coming to see me? <laughs> Hi, I you brother. I'd come up and join you. Glad you did. Glad you did. Good to see you. Glad you're here today. Thank you. Good. All right, let's try this. Let's go to the book of Exodus now, just trying to practice what I just shared with you. If you have a Bible, it should be very early in your Bible. You should find Genesis, and hey, right after that, you're getting real close, right? You're going to find the book of Exodus. So I want you to take your Bibles. Now, if you don't have a Bible with you, uh, look there. should be one in the, uh, behind the seats there. By the way, there's some really cool notepads that you can pull out. And I hope that you'll use those. We want you to use those. Uh, you can pull that out. And you've got those note sheets there. It's very important. I want you to use those. Uh, you, you don't have a photographic memory. Most of you. Some of you do. Uh, women, there are some things I know that you don't forget. <laughs> but generally speaking, we all need to take notes. Okay, so let me encourage you to that. The book of Exodus. And we're going to just hover around chapter 2, chapter 3, and chapter 4. Now, think with me a moment. The title of the message this morning is up on the screen already. It says, Which God are you? Honestly, that's a question that a character here in the scripture we're going to read about named Moses asks God. And it really is a legitimate question. Now, let me, let me explain why I say that. Um, this Moses that I speak of Really, the Moses that we're going to look at today is what I would call the secular Moses. He is a Moses that uh, really would blend in well in our culture. As I've gotten more and more acclimated to the culture and the climate here in Denver, the spiritual climate here in Denver, I think Moses is a guy that really, certainly in his early days, would have fit in nicely here in Denver. I mean, a lot, I think Moses was probably a nice guy. In fact, some of the early things we see in his life uh, speak to that. But Moses is a guy in his, his secular persona. He's a guy that he was used to royalty. Um, he literally was the prince of Egypt. He literally was adopted in as a part of that family. I'll talk more about that in a moment. So he was accustomed to the finer things, the nice things of life, the nicer things of life. Um, he was um, without a doubt... Um, well, he had a reputation. Everybody knew who Moses was. Moses was this guy that, that if you were to pull up uh, at the sheep crossing in your chariot and be behind Moses in his chariot, uh, on one side, uh, maybe of his chariot, he would have a little sticker that would say EU, where he had gone to school. And, and uh, that's Egypt University, by the way, for those of you who don't know that. And then on the other side of the chariot, I just feel like that Moses would have had one of those um, coexist stickers on his chariot. I, I just think he would, he would be that kind of guy. I mean, I really do. That's how I see Moses, the secular Moses, in, in these early days. When you think about him being raised in the culture of Egypt, and, and, and which he was, um, he's a guy that was very engaged and involved in, in the culture. Now, some of you know this story, and you know that God was was working in Moses' life long before he even understood it. And again, we'll get to some of that in a moment as we sort of fill in the blanks on some of this this morning. But, uh, but, but I, I just think, and I just got to say it this way, I just think Moses would have been a rocking cool guy. I, I just really do. I, I picture him with long hair. I really do. Now, you don't understand, you don't know this about me, but, but back in the day, I had hair about halfway down my back. And if I didn't have this bald spot here today, I'd probably go for it again, you know, but I'm just not sure I could pull it off anymore. Uh, but I just see Moses, you know, just this, this guy, this, 
this young adult. I mean, he's man about town. And, you know, I'm just thinking that the chicks probably are just, I mean, the girls are all over him everywhere he goes. I mean, I don't see this in the Bible, but I'm just telling you, that's how I see Moses in my mind's eye. And really, really a, a good guy. I mean, he's just secular Moses kind of living the dream. And then that dream falls apart in a variety of ways and for a variety of of, of reasons. You remember last week we talked about the God moment? God brought Moses to his God moment. And Moses had an encounter with God that radically changed him forever. Think about the culture which Moses lived in in his early years. It would have been polytheistic, it would have been pantheistic, it would have been synchristic. It would have been a, a culture that literally merged together all religions that were known in the world that day and really would have promoted that really, hey, this coexistence thing is really what we need to be all about. I mean, that's the kind humanitarian way to approach things. And so Moses would have been inundated with that. And I believe in his responses to God that we're going to look at in just a few moments. I believe you can see that coming out in some of the things that Moses would say. God's people had been in the bondage of slavery of Egypt for some 430 years. We begin reading in the book of Exodus, and there's a statement made. This, this guy named Joseph that God had put in position was an unbelievable leader, and the favor of God was all over him. But the Bible says that Joseph died, and there was a king put on the throne that knew not Joseph. And that's more than just didn't know him personally. And that means that he didn't follow in the ways of Joseph. And for some 430 years, God's people were under this tyrannical, horrible slave environment where they had literally gone from, from being God's favored, blessed people to a people who now were, were treated horribly. The new Pharaoh, in fact, would, would see that God's people were still prospering because God's hand is always going to be on his people and, and that Pharaoh became jealous, and he said, listen, they're beginning to outnumber us. One day they're going to wake up and realize it, and they're, they're going to take over. And so he began to do some horrible things. He was literally the first abortionist. He began to talk about that I read about in the Bible. He began to have babies slaughtered. In fact, he, he told the midwives to, you know, when, when, when these babies are born, you, you let us know. We're going we're to take these children out so the population would begin to decrease instead of increase. And of course, some of you know that story. I won't go into detail, but God intervened there. And so Pharaoh finally decides, he says, okay, here's what we're going to do. Listen, all the males that are born, we want you to kill them uh, the moment they are, are born. The ladies, it's okay. They can live. We'll use them as our slaves in a, a, a different way. But these men, I, I want them eradicated from the face of the planet. No more males uh, from, from these Israelites, from God's people. But God's hand was still on his people. They started with 70. 70 people went into Egypt. When we read here in Exodus chapter 3 and chapter 4, we have at least 600,000 men plus women and children. Let me say that again. We go from 70 to 600,000 men plus the women and the children. And it's in that environment under the, the attack that God literally speaks to Moses. And God begins to call Moses to do something very, very significant. Now, I mentioned a moment ago that one of the questions that Moses asked God, I believe, was very legitimate. In fact, God asked, uh, excuse me, Moses asked three what I would call very legitimate questions. Take your Bible there and open up to the third chapter of Exodus now. And let's begin to read just a little bit to, to look and give you a little, little bit of the context there. But let's begin to read there in chapter 3. Oh, let's jump in. Uh, let's go to verse 7, all right? Verse 7. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters. For I am aware of their suffering, so I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Hivite and the Perizzite and the, H I'm sorry, Hivite and the Jebusite and the Denverite and the Evergreenite and the, well, you get the picture here, okay? 
Didn't say anything about the bright night, by the way. But anyway, it's, 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 <laughs> hi, Monty, how you doing this morning? Good to see you, buddy. His daughter said I need to humiliate him today, so I'm going to start early, <laughs> work my way through the, uh, through the message today. Which God, which God are you? Let me, let me get to the question. Look over here in verse 13. Then Moses said to God, behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now, that they may say to me, or they may say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? Now, the tradition was, the custom was, certainly in Old Testament times, that if you spoke of a God and if you prayed uh, to a God, you would pray in his name. First Kings 18, where we see the mighty prophet of God, and he's dealing with those prophets of Baal there on Mount Carmel. And they, he said, listen, you, you cry out to your God in your name, and I'll call on the name of my God, and we'll see which one shows up. And by the way, the God that is speaking to Moses here is the one who showed up then as well. So the question is legitimate. And in our culture today, you're going to get this question. If you engage people for the, for the purpose of the gospel, you're going to get this question. Which God do you represent? Which God are you talking about? Who in the world, which God are you? So Moses turns to God and he says, okay, God, I, I'm, I'm hearing what you're asking me to do. But now let, let's clarify this. Which God are you? So I want to answer that question a little bit this morning. I hope to equip us, and maybe there are several of you here this morning who maybe you're asking that question already. Which God are you talking about, Pastor? Which God do you represent really? And I want to say to you clearly, it's the God of the Bible. It's not the God of any other book. It's not the God of any other system. It's not the God of any other group. It's the God of the Bible. And if the God that I represent to you ever does not line up with the God of the Bible, I want you to know I am wrong. And you have every right to ignore what I say at that point because I have no authority apart from my God that is represented clearly, perfectly, I believe, in the Holy Scriptures. So it's the God of the Bible. Which God are we living for? And what do we know about that God? There's a couple of things. First of all, which God are you? He is the God who cares for us. That's the God I'm talking about. The God who cares for us. Now, I hope you'll jot that down somewhere. This is significant. The God who cares for us. Back in chapter 3, begin reading there again with me in verse 7 as I, I walk along here. He says, Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their sufferings. Do you hear those words? So I have, look at this, I have come down. Now listen, folks, that is big time. You see, we don't have a God who's trying to get you to come up to him. Why? Because our God knows it is impossible for any human to come up to him in their own strength, their own ability, their own power. It is impossible for you to get to God any way that could be contrived by your effort, by your ability. The Bible is real clear. Our God, the God that we're talking about says that our best is like filthy rags to him. The great news is we have a God and the God that we represent here at Riverside is not a God that is saying you keep working hard enough, you keep thinking correctly, you keep involving yourself in humanitarian efforts in the community, you keep doing enough good, you get green enough and you'll make it to me. No, our God says I know it's impossible for you to do that. Our God says I am coming down to you. Now somebody ought to be shouting by now. I mean, I'm telling you that's big stuff, folks. Now, unless you think too highly of yourself, <coughs> okay, so this is the God that comes down to us. He said, so I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Now, behold. The cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. Notice a couple of things here. First of all, write down the word people. Now, this is not going to be on the screen, okay? But just jot this down, the word people. A God who cares. What does he care about? He cares about people. 
That means he cares about you. If we read through, or as we read through those scriptures, did you notice his attentiveness? Did you notice his awareness of their situation? I want to tell you today that the God that I represent this morning is a God who is attentive to what's going on in your life. He is a God who is aware of what's going on in your life. We all feel like sometimes we want to say to God, hey God, hello, do you not see what I'm going through here, right? I'll give you an example. You guys pray for us today. Our house, that we have an open house in our house in Oklahoma. And uh, yeah, on my mom's house and our place. So you pray that God will send a buyer today and he will write a check today <laughs> and say, I don't even need to go to the bank. Just, let, just give this to that guy and I'll move in next week. That's good with me. I'll get about 100 of you. We'll get cattle trailers and go we'll move our stuff and we'll get it over here, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> there you go. But every once in a while, I kind of get a little panicky and I think, okay, God, we've been here a couple of months now and our house is still there. Hello? I mean, really. Can I tell you something? God is very aware. And God is doing something. Sherry and I don't like to talk about it because we end up getting in a fight. (laughs) But we know God is doing something in our hearts. God is holding the sale of our home until our hearts are right for what we're to do next. Where we're to live. What that's to look like. So that some of our family can live with us. Now, you laugh with me, but I, I really believe our God is aware. He's attentive. And I believe he cares enough to, to hold out on us sometimes until we are at that spot where we will be willing to line up with his will. That, that's a God who really does care about us. The word he uses there, cry, is the word nikah in the original language. It is a, a deep cry of the heart. It is a desperate cry of the heart. Oh, sometimes I hope God will give me liberty to preach on the difference in crying out to God and praying. There's a huge difference. You just do a little study sometime of the, con- of the contrast of those two concepts of crying out or, or just praying. Praying's good. Don't, don't misunderstand me. We're to always pray, but there's a difference. There is an awareness. God is watching. He knows what's going on. I was sitting actually on, a, on our property in Oklahoma. We had 16 acres, and I was up in one of the stands I have up in a tree um, as a, um, with my bow um, as an observer of wildlife. <laughs> And I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, I hear this noise, and I look down, and there is a bobcat. You guys know what bobcats are? They're like house cats on steroids. (laughs) And I look, and there's this bobcat, but I mean, it's huge. I'm telling you, the Oklahoma has huge bobcats. I mean, this thing is like a medium-sized dog. I mean, he's, he's really big. And I look at him, and he's just kind of, I mean, all fours, he has spread out. Why? Because he is aware of me. I had not seen him, but he is aware of me. And so I saw him, and he literally, I I was about, oh, 20 yards or so from a fence line with with thick woods over here, just waiting for some creatures to come out so I could observe them (laughs) with my bow. And he he literally just without, I mean, looking at me in the tree, he literally just without, kind of like this, you know, like the cartoons do, he kind of shuffled. 20 yards into the woods, and he never took his eyes off of me. He was aware, and he was attentive to my every move because I was wanting to pick my bow up and observe him a little more closely. (laughs) But I didn't get that opportunity. Are you listening? God is like that. I really do believe that God is that attentive He is aware. God does not sleep, the Bible says. He does not slumber. He doesn't take a siesta in the afternoon. I mean, listen, God is on. He is spot on. He knows what you are going through. We can trust him. Our God cares for us, and he cares about people. And our God is the original promise keeper, by the way. Our God is a God, write down the word promises. Our God cares for us concerning promises. When you read a promise from God in his word, you can write it down. It may not be in your time frame. It may not fit on your calendar. It may not come up at the time that you demand that it does. But I'm telling you, if God has given you a promise in his word, it will come to pass. It will. 
Our God cares enough that when he promises us something from the scripture, he will do that. In chapter 2, verse 24, uh, God makes this statement. He says, so God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God remembered. The word remembered there is a powerful word. Um, it, it's actually, yada is how it's pronounced in the original language. It's a word which means, um, uh, well, the root of it, at least, it means to know. And so God knows what he has promised us. God remembers what he has said about us. God knows who we are in Christ Jesus. God understands the relationship, the covenant that he has made with us. And our God cares. Our God cares about people. Our God cares about the promises. Now, Moses, at this point, in my mind's eye, I I hear him thinking, okay, great. You said you've heard the cry of the people. You, You say that you keep your promises But I'm thinking at this point, Moses might be saying, well, what about me? What about me? Because Moses had been through a very difficult time. Let's, Let's put that down to where it really matters. What about you? Maybe this morning you're saying, okay, I I hear you, preacher. You're telling me that God cares. You're, You're telling me he's aware and attentive. But why am I going through what I'm going through? Well, can I tell you that part of it is, is because we build a world based on the way we want it to look. We're Americans. It's all about us, right? It's all about convenience. It's all about right now. We're not big on patience. We're not, build, we're not big on building character. <laughs> you know, that comes with some effort. We're not big on waiting for anything. And so Moses here, it seems to me that, that Moses may have forgotten what God had done in his life. Because this is a God who cares about people. It's a God who cares about the promises that he's made. But jot down a couple of other words that I just, God just sort of gave me this this morning early. He, he cares about us personally. Not just the big picture. We, we know what God's going to do with the church because we read it in the Bible. We know that God loves us and he's never going to fail us or forsake us. We know that. But sometimes we see that for the other people. It's just like the speed limit on the highway. Now, I'm all about driving under grace. I'm not under the law, right? I am... But it's like, the, it's like the laws of the land. That's, that's for other people. That's not, that doesn't apply to me. Listen, these things apply to you as well. And so God cares about us personally. Think about Moses. Here Moses is, not the young strapping guy in a chariot running around Egypt that I described as the secular Moses. You say, well, you're stretching some of that, Pastor. I, I readily admit that. But, but here now we see this aging exiled shepherd Moses I mean he's no longer rolling around in the finest of Egypt smelling and looking like royalty now he's walking around behind sheep get the picture you ever been around sheep hello how many of you have been around sheep really okay they don't smell good do they And have you noticed they're not the brightest of creatures? (laughs) And did you notice that God calls us sheep? (laughs) That made you mad, didn't it? I can tell. I can tell. He cares about him personally. And God is beginning to move once again in Moses' life in a way that Moses could see. God was always moving. But sometimes we can't see it. Write down the word protection. The word protection. God cares about us in that he protects us. Moses had forgotten that right after three months of age, he was placed in a basket lined with with tar and literally pushed out into the Nile River. That was that season when Pharaoh was killing all the baby boys that were being born of the Israelites. And Moses had been put out in that basket and God protected him while all his friends and cousins and people that he lived in the community with, all those little baby boys were being slaughtered. 
But God protected Moses. How many of you ever felt like you've been in a situation before that you just honestly didn't know if you were going to make it? Anybody ever been through that? I mean, emotionally, physically? Come on, raise your hand if that's you. I mean, you ever been at a time in your life where you just thought, man, I can't go on like, let's try it again. Everybody, let me, let me get a, okay, good. Got most of you in the room. Hey, can I tell you something? You're here. You're here. Okay. Y'all are killing me today. What am I trying to say to you? Well, I, I think sometimes we forget. We're in that moment and we're broken and, and we just don't know how we're going to make it. Maybe it's a, a, a relative, a, a child or a, a spouse or a sickness or whatever it is. And we are devastated and broken and, and we just, we, it's so heavy on us. We're not even sure we're going to make it through the night. But look, God brought you through it. God brought you through it and you are here. Why? Because we have a God who cares about us. Now do you see what I'm saying? He cares about us personally. He protects us. We are here. And then there's the provision. That would be the last word with a P there that I want you to write down. There's the provision of God. I mean, there, most of us probably have had times when we've, we've been hungry or we didn't know how we were going to pay the rent or we, we couldn't cover a bill. I remember when Sherry and I first started in ministry, I was making $25 a week. I mean, they doubled my salary and I thought, woohoo! $50 a week? I mean, really, does that help? Well, I, I promise you, when you're making $25, 50 is big time. And, and, and we started our first pastorate, and we were making $125 a week at that time. And we had two little girls, and, you know, it was a big deal to have milk in the refrigerator. And yet, we knew that God had given us a promise that we couldn't outgive God, and we, all need to be, we always need to be faithful with the tithe and not steal from God. And so we did that in spite of all that. It was, it was very, very rough, to be honest with you. And our, our, our young people in our church, because we were so young, we really connected with them at that time. They'd come over to our house, and we lived right beside the church, and they'd hit the refrigerator, and they'd drink everything we had in there. And we'd think, man, how are we going to how are we going to give the babies milk in the morning? I mean, how are we going to do that? But you know what? God always provided. God always provided. Somehow we made it through it. And remember, some of the greatest words I know are simply this, this too shall pass. I mean, it really is. When you're in that position, remember, there is a God, the God we're talking about. And it may not be the God that you know, and it may not be the God that you're into, and it may not be the God that you're checking out. But I'm telling you, the God I'm talking about, He cares about us. And he'll do those things for you. And that's the one where, man, God gave his sister. There his sister was right there watching the basket the whole time. And who, lo and behold, who did he send to find that basket but Pharaoh's daughter? Now, that's pretty cool. Now, I'm telling you. I mean, that Pharaoh, his daughter, I mean, think about it. She had access to all the resources of Egypt. And she just happened to be the one that finds little Mo in that basket. I mean, I was trying to think of an illustration. How, how, can we, how can we really grasp that? It would kind of like be, I suppose, being Sasha and Malia today. You know what I'm talking about? We have a president, remember? <laughs> He's got two daughters. And I just want to say, I think his daughters are just awesome. I don't know what it is. I just love those little girls. And whatever you think about our president, for all accounts, he seems to be a great dad. I mean, he really does. Now, I, I don't know, I, I don't know personal life, but it just, you know how I know that? Because when the kids love the daddy, daddy's done something right with the kids. Now, I know about rebellion. I got one of those hard heads in my family, but, but I'm just telling you, generally speaking. And so I'm thinking, did, did you watch the news this week? You know, they're on vacation, and of course, Obama's going back and forth to all these summit meetings and stuff, but Michelle and Sasha and Malia, they're out doing all And did you see the other day they had lunch with Bono? Do y'all know who that is? You really ought to find out if you don't. I mean, he's kind of like a secular Moses, you know, kind of same kind of guy. But, but he's, he's like, this guy has major influence. He's influenced your children, whether you know it or not. And he's influenced a lot of the adults in the room, and they just won't admit it right now. But he had lunch with them. And I'm thinking, you know, that's the way it would have been with Moses. I mean, he's just big time, everything he wants. He's got it. He's Pharaoh's daughter. Oh, and then when they find somebody to take care of him, they just happen to find his mom. <laughs> Do you think God was in that or not? 
Absolutely. Can I tell you, our God is attentive. He's aware. He's into what's going on in your life. You may not see it. You may not understand it. But don't miss it. This is a God who cares. Which God are you? The God who cares for us. Secondly, very quickly, the God who comes to us. I already touched on this, so I'm not going to spend as much time on it. But back in chapter 3 as well, if we see where it picks up here in verse 1. Now Moses was pastoring, pastoring excuse me, the flock of Jethro, the father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Oreb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he looked uh, aside, when he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. He's a God who cares for us, and he's the God who comes to us. Remember the condition of Moses. It had radically changed. He was no longer the rock star of Egypt. He was no longer the man. In fact, really, if you go back and you read these scriptures leading up to this, he had just tried to do one thing right, and it seemed like it cost him his whole life. What are you talking about, Pastor? Pastor? Well, back in chapter 2, he comes out and he sees one of his people being persecuted. And so he looks left and right and he jumps on this dude. And I don't know if Moses meant to kill him, but he did. And how did his friends respond? Well, what are you going to do now? Turn on us? I mean, have you ever done the right thing? <coughs> And it seemed to have cost you everything. I want to remind you, Moses would learn this lesson. You never lose when you do what's right. It may take a while for it to come back around. But doing the right thing is always the right thing. This is a God who comes to us. All of a sudden, there is fire on the mountain. Now, I know that's a touchy subject right now here in Colorado and other parts of the country as well. But I thought, you know, how appropriate. What an applicable illustration for us today to think about fire on the mountain. And watching one of the firefighters being interviewed and saying, listen, what kind of impact has this had on you? His statement was, you know, when you're in the midst of that fire, you're in the moment and you really don't pay attention to a lot of things going on. And you really don't even notice your own potential destruction but he said this he said I will tell you though he said that smoke never leaves your nostrils I thought about that for a moment and I thought you know that is exactly what happened to Moses God came to Moses there was fire on the mountain by a bush that was burning but not consumed by the fire now, by the way, that's a pretty cool God that can pull that off. And Moses was drawn to that. He said, man, I, I've just got to turn aside. I've got to see this. I mean, there was something. He knew there was something unique going on in his rather boring life at this point. And Moses turns to that. And, and remember, this is a man that to this point, because he was still to some degree the secular Moses, secular in mindset, not secular in practice because he had lost all that, but this is a man that literally the stench of the world had filled his nostrils. Are you staying with me on the analogy here? The stench of the world had filled his nostrils. It was all about pleasure. It was all about the best. It was all about having fun. It was all about the provisions of Egypt. It was all about the finer things of life. It was about the next thing that he could uh, adhere to, that he could climb to in his life. The stench of the world was there, and it had impacted him big time. And yet God was working in his life. God was working in his heart, and God was drawing him. And now the stench of the world, in just a moment, would be changed by the smoke of God. Church, we need to allow God to flush out the stench of the world in our nostrils. 
We need to get in the presence of God and like Moses, have an undeniable experience that changes us forever. I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about being spiritual. I'm talking about having a life-changing experience with the God of the Bible through His Son, Jesus Christ, that changes everything about you. And I've, I've encountered so many people in 35 years of ministry that have religion. They have a spiritual leaning. But, but if, you, if you press them for a supernatural transformation that changed everything about them, so many of them just, just face you with a glazed look. And yet I'm telling you, Moses had an undeniable encounter with God that changed him. God is a pretty awesome intention, <coughs> excuse me, attention getter. What do I mean by that? Well, back to chapter <coughs> 3, verse 2. The angel of the, door, uh, of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire <coughs> from the midst of a bush. Sixty-seven times in the scripture it says the angel of the Lord. This is the only time in the book of Exodus. It's significant. God was attentive. God was aware. God cared. God reached out to Moses. And literally, I believe in a flash through his mind, this was the culmination of all that God had been preparing him for to this moment. And remember again, I talked about it last week, the God moments in life. Everybody is going to have the God moments. I just realized I had some water over here. I don't have Diet Coke, but I've got water. <clears throat> remember the God moments? How many of you remember the God moments? Okay, so I can have time to drink my water, turn to each other and say, everybody has a God moment. Okay, now turn to the person that didn't say that to you and say, even you, stubborn. Okay, <clears throat> you love me, don't you? Yeah. yeah, I knew it. For now, <laughs> are we having fun yet? Moses had this God moment. Think about the grace of God to bring him to his God moment. How would I characterize it? I would say he had faced devastation. Write that down somewhere. His God moment was characterized by devastation. Literally, he lost it all. Sometimes God is gracious enough to let us lose it all. So how can you say that? I, listen, I, I don't mean to imply that losing a family member, I don't mean that. But sometimes our stuff that we cling to, sometimes our stuff that we are enslaved to. You know, I, there was a time in my life where I had a Corvette in my garage, two motorcycles, two jet skis, a uh, brand new, what was that, a Yukon or uh, I don't remember, a, the short version of the Suburban, whatever those are. I had one of those. Sherry had a, 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 some kind of moped or something. I don't know. <laughs> Man, I had all that stuff. And you know, what I, you know what I found myself doing all the time? Taking one of them to a repair shop. Working on something, cleaning up something, having something else that I had to pay for a license and insurance and blah, 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 blah. Or should I say yada, 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 yada. <laughs> God remembered. He took it all away. He took it all away from Moses. But it was also isolation. His God moment was devastation. His God moment was isolation. He's on the backside of the mountain, in the desert, by himself, and God speaks. Can I tell you, it's really difficult to hear from God when you're in the clamor of everyday life. That's why I try to teach people, look, there needs to be a time early in the morning when you get up and you spend time with God and you hear from Him first. And you allow Him to set the agenda for the day. Because if you wait and you try to do it at night... That didn't make sense anyway. Who puts on their armor after they've been in a battle? I mean, you don't fight naked, do you? Oh, that's an image that'll set, won't it? I mean, that, that, yeah. But think about it. So many of us do. Well, I'll talk to God at night because I'm a night person. No, no. You don't go through the battle during the day and then put on the armor at night. He was in that isolation when he was all alone. And, and, and let me just say this, and I'll move on to this point. God 
does not save you through your grandma or your auntie or your cousin. God deals with us one-on-one, one-on-one in isolation, just you looking into the face of a holy God. And then humiliation. Okay, we've got devastation, isolation, and humiliation. This is all a picture of Moses and his God moment. And what I mean by humiliation, he's now from the prince of Egypt. He is now literally, literally taking care of Jethro's sheep. It's not even his own sheep. He's had it all. Can you imagine how humiliating that is? In fact, Jethro will show up in a little bit later in the story and tell him what he's doing wrong. Don't you love father-in-laws? <laughs> you didn't get that, obviously. <laughs> a God who comes to us. Let me hit this quickly. Number three, the God who calls us. Which God are you? The God who cares for us. The God who comes to us, he allows us sometimes graciously to have that God moment. And he's the God who calls us. The God who calls us. Chapter 3, verses 4, 5, and 6. Let me hit those again. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. And then he said, do not come near Here, remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said also, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Can I share with you, I'm, I'm very passionate, obviously, about relationships and certainly a personal, intimate relationship with God But I do think for some of us who have been around these holy things and the holy person of God himself for a long time, I think familiarity sometimes gets us in trouble. I want to make it real clear. This is not your big buddy in the sky. This is a holy, righteous God who allows you because of his goodness and grace to enter his presence and to literally get right up in and hear his heart beating and to have that personal relationship where you can talk with him just like your best friend or brother would to another brother. He wants that. He desires that. But we should never get to the place where we don't blush over sin to where we become so familiar with God that we think we can just slap him on the back and he'll just sort of look the other way when we're living in a way that does not honor him. God does not change. He is the same today, yesterday, and forever. And his standards of righteousness and holiness, while we have that through Christ Jesus, he still calls us in the power and the person of the Holy Spirit to live in that holiness and that righteousness. This God calls us, but he calls us on his terms. I have a friend that you'll get to meet hopefully in the future. She's just an unbelievable singer. She was actually my personal assistant back in Oklahoma City. And when she comes onto the platform to sing, first thing you'll see her do, you'll see her do it before she gets there. She'll take her shoes off. And it's just a personal thing with her. And people have given her a hard time about it over the years. And people have said how inappropriate it is and all that. But she has a personal thing that when she is ministering in the name of Jesus, she wants to come with nothing but in humility. And when she takes her shoes off, it reminds her of that. And she remembers that she is on holy ground when she represents the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And folks, I'm telling you, that's a beautiful thing right there. It's an amazing thing. That kind of humility, that kind of understanding. And, and I'm not sure I read, I don't know how many commentaries on this over the years, trying to figure out why in the world he would take the shoes. Is it a cultural thing? Is it because they're dirty and, you know, he's coming in the presence of God and all the filth that it represents and the customs of the day? I've, I've read all that, but I, I really just think God was saying one more time, listen, listen, if you're going to approach me, there's some things that you, you need to understand. There's some things going to have to go. If you're going to have a relationship with me, you need to understand it's going to be on my terms. Could it be that God was just testing Moses? I mean, let's forget all the speculation. Could it be that he was just saying, I want to see if you really want to get in my presence. Take your shoes off, boy. Moses could have said, well, God, you really haven't seen my toenails lately. They're bad. I, I'm, you know, I don't want to do that. But, you know, it's like it, it, Moses just, he, he does that. We get so caught up in these peripheral. We get so caught up in these surface issues. 
We get so caught up in things that are preference. They're not divine revelation. And I think about last Sunday and how all the guys dressed down. And well, that was just so fun. You know, guys just came in relaxed and people felt so comfortable. Can I tell you, sometimes I think the way we dress represents the, the position of our heart. I'm not saying always, and I'm not saying, you know, if you wear this or that. I mean, look, I've got on a, a, a really, I've got on a dress shirt today that I, I bet costs more than some of your suits. Forgive me, Jesus, for buying this shirt. I bought it several years ago. <laughs> but I wanted one of these cool little alligator shirts, so I paid, like, unbelievable money for this thing, you know? <laughs> I have a story to tell you, but I'll save that for another time. And I looked around, and we're kind of back to normal today, and we've got such a blend, which I love. We've got a blend. We've got suits and ties, and we've got jeans, and we've got shorts. I'm sure I haven't seen it yet, but I'm sure they're here. And, and, and I just personally love that, and I think God loves that. And I hope that we'll always be a church that we won't get hung up on demonic issues. You know, God's real clear about it. He says he's not really worried about what we put on the outside. God is worried about the inside. And hopefully we'll be that kind of church. You know, people used to argue with me a lot, and they'd say, well, I just believe in wearing my best to church. And I'd say, well, why don't you go buy a tux? <laughs> now, Al Harnick and Bob Roscoe, I am told, were talking about wearing a tux last Sunday just to, <laughs> just to rub me the wrong way. And I know these guys hard. I, I know it's not about what you wear. But think about it just a moment. If, if it's all about this outward thing, and I really didn't plan on saying this, but here we go. If it's not about this outward thing, then, then if, if you really think you're best, I want to ask you something. Do you put on your suit and your nicest dress to get in your quiet time in the morning? Now, don't cheat and say, well, I do it right before I go to work. Of course I do. No, I mean, I'm just telling you, it's Saturday, okay, and you're going to have your time with the Lord early in the morning. Do you shower and shave, legs, face, hopefully if a guy, not both, but you know, I mean, whatever you do, do you get your suit on, your tie, do you get all buttoned up, hair fixed, all that, and do you go get in the presence of God? My guess is no. So is it really about God, or is it about the people who are going to see you? I will wear suits. I will wear what I have on. I will wear jeans occasionally. And I, whatever you're comfortable with, whatever, that's fine. I will tell you, I'm one of those weirdos that I am just as comfortable in a suit and tie as I am with a pair of shorts. I know you think impossible. No, it's true. Ask my wife. I am. But I think what God was trying to say to Moses here, at least one of the things was, is that Moses clearly... It's about coming on my terms. I think there are some things, not that we put on, but that we put off that make us right in the presence of God. Like laying aside our pride. Laying aside our demands. And coming to God and saying, God, take me as I am, yes. But God, transform my heart. And one of the things that I've loved about Riverside is I believe that's who you are. I believe that's what you're all about. We come to God on His terms. He is the God that calls us. And it's not about dressing up or dressing down or whatever. It's about being what God calls us to be. Just, well, let me jump to this. God was calling Moses into a deeper heart and life relationship so he could speak into his life what he had for Moses to do. And I want to say to you, if you have to put on a tie or put on a pair of shorts to get over the hump, do it. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Whatever is that thing that, that is a hang-up for you, you, you just be do that. It's just like, and we worship. Listen, if you want to raise your hands, raise your hands and worship. If you want to shout, shout. It's all in the Bible. And I'll tell you, as long as in the Scripture, as long as it's what God's Word says, you'll be okay in this place. All right? Listen to me. Listen to me. But once again, what is it that God is speaking into our life? What is it that He says? Not what is it that we want to do or think we should do. But what is it that God says that will prepare us? And I believe that's what God was doing with Moses. 
He is the God who calls us. He calls us into a relationship with him. I love it one more time that the Bible says that God has come down. He speaks to Moses. He says, Moses, I want you to go. Moses argues with God. Isn't it amazing how we argue with God? I'm almost done. Hang in there with me. Isn't it amazing how we argue with God over what he's calling us to do? Moses could have said, God, why would I go help them? I tried to help them one more time, one time before, and they rejected me. And that's probably a lot of you in this room. You've been burned at some point. And you're saying, you know, I I know what the right thing to do is, but I tried to do that right thing. And I'm saying to you, you will never have peace and joy in your life until you do whatever it is that God is calling you to do. Moses had all those issues, and Moses was just not sure if, if God was going to pull this off or not. And he said, God, listen, I, I, how do I know? How, how, I, how do I know, chapter 4, how, how do I know they're going to listen to me? And he says, Moses, what is it that, that you're holding in your hand? Well, he's a shepherd. So he's got a staff, a rod, a shepherd's rod. And God says to him, he says, Moses, throw it down. Oh, I believe, there's so, I believe that's so rich. Do you know how a shepherd depended upon that staff, that rod. He says, throw it down. Is there anything that you're depending on today that's keeping you from doing what God's called you to do? Is there anything that you're holding on to? Will you trust God? Will you throw it down? He throws it down. You know, the Bible says it turns into a snake. Now, folks, I grew up in the South. I'm a Nolens boy. I know about snakes. Remember? Duck Dynasty. Those are my peeps. Now I'm telling you. I know these people. Those could be my cousins. Nah, they've got too many teeth to be my cousins. But I'm just telling you. That thing turned into a snake. Now I just got to tell you, I love you. You bring a snake, a snake around me. I'm going to hurt you. (laughs) Cats, demonic, I can cast them out. I'm okay. Snakes, snakes, we're going to have, we're going to meet Jesus. I'm just telling you, somebody is. So I'm just telling you now. And don't even think about it. I know what you're thinking right now. Staff members, I'm going to help you find another church. Now don't mess with me with the snake. And then God says, Moses, pick it up. (laughs) You're right. (laughs) You just hear Moses. Um, Hey, God, you're not really around from here, are you? I mean, you don't don't know this place too well, do you? (laughs) Snake God, well, pick him up. (laughs) He didn't do that. Reached down, picks it up, and what does it do? Turns back into a rock. Here's what God is saying. Moses, I am calling you. I got this. That's what God's saying. Moses, I'm calling you, and I, I've, I've got this. Trust me. Now, Moses goes on to argue with God. He's just like us. He keeps arguing with God, and I think God just finally gets tired of him. He says, whatever, I'll send Aaron. You know, he'll, he'll talk. You, just shut up, Moses. Just do it, okay? You know, I mean, it's kind of it's in some frustration there. God is calling you. How do you know? If there's anything in this message this morning that has kind of maybe pricked your heart just a little bit, something that has spoken to you, and you know, I've learned that even sometimes it may have caused you to get a little angry. Sometimes that's the Holy Spirit sort of shaking you up a little bit. You know, if it gets us to move off dead center, it's a good thing. And maybe this morning you, you've sensed something and you, you, don't, you don't know this thing. I keep talking about the Holy Spirit and you're saying, what is that? That sounds kind of creepy to me. But it's literally the, the third person we call of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. It is that part of God that is not bound by space and dimension and time. It's, it's that part of God that literally is hovering around the earth. It's and you say, well, how can that be? Now you're just getting all weird. Can, can, I, can I just say this to you? If a God has to be like you, is he really much of a God? And so we've got a God that's beyond us. 
We're not God, but we know him. And his spirit, that's what some of you are sensing right now. There's something that is drawing you. There's something to, that is speaking to you. You know he's calling you into that undeniable experience that would forever change you. God wants today to fill you with that smoke that will never leave. And he wants to replace the stench of the world that has left you flat and empty. That's the God that we're talking about. And my question to you is simply this. Is that the God you know? Not the God of the Baptist denomination. Not the God of the Catholic Church or the Presbyterian Church or the whatever church. The God of the Bible. The God who cares about you. The God who's attentive and aware. Oh, a God who has an unbelievable plan for you and loves you. And it's that God that I believe today by faith is speaking to every heart in this room. Will we listen? Could I just pray? Father, thank you this morning for your word. and God, I pray that you would even take that which I twisted up and messed up and contorted. God, I pray that you would just speak through that, pierce through that with your very presence. Lord, drive truth home in our hearts and our minds. And then, God, come down in the person of your spirit. And, God, put your arms around us and draw us, Lord, into that love relationship with you. God, for those in the room who have never had that personal encounter with you, God, today, would you touch them, love them? Lord, calm their fears. Let them know, God, that you care, and God, you have only what's best for them in store for them. God, draw them right now. Lord, for those that, like me that have known you for a long time, but God, somehow we've gotten off the path. Lord, maybe we think you've forgotten us in some areas. God, help us to know that you do hear. God, give us a grace today to cry out to you and to see your hand Restore us. Move us in the direction you want us to go. And God, I pray that would be true for our church. God, let us truly be the light on this hill that you intend for us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.